Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I'm going to continue what I started in this Sunday before last. And um, as I actually, to the week, week before Saturday, week before yesterday, Saturday, I'm working on this particular message about where to go with it after I preached it the last Sunday. Actually, it was, it was a week yesterday, and I received some bad news. And I told Sister Jody that I was going to talk about this. I did tell you that, didn't I? So, a lot of you remember, or maybe some of you remember, her ex-husband Steve. When Jody first started coming here, God had been dealing with her about getting back right with God. And God sent her here, and we loved her, and still do. And um, she talked about her husband and said he needed to be right with God. So I said, you pray and I'll pray. We'll just see what God does. So a while later, I said, I want to come out to the house and just talk to him. Just want to meet him. Jody and I, it turns out, we were in the same kindergarten class, Rockport Elementary School. And, uh, of course, we moved right in the middle of my kindergarten year, so we didn't grow up together. We just found out we was in the same, same class. So, anyway, I met Steve and talked to him, and he was just a, just a working guy, like most guys, and and then I began to talk to him about the Lord. And he said to me, I'll never forget it. He said, Mike, he said, I go to sleep most nights asking God for help. And I said, tonight's the night that you can ask him for real. So Steve prayed the sinner's prayer, his house that night. And I remember when we baptized him. And there was a, a song that the Gaithers sang at that time. They baptized Jesse Taylor in Cedar Creek last Sunday. We played that song. And, and there for a while, if, if, you, if you've ever heard me say, like on Pastor Mike Online, I'm going to open up a can of King James on this, it came from Steve. Because he got into a little conversation with somebody at work that they went to another church and they used all these other Bibles and they started, and Steve said, oh no, it's King James. They're going, no, it ain't. And Steve said, well, I'm going to open up a can of King James on these people. I can tell you that right now. That's where I got it from. And somebody sent me a can with a label on it that says King James. With King James picture on it. And after a while, I could tell he was struggling. That threefold cord is not easily broken. And one time I talked to him, was out at his house, I could smell the alcohol on his breath. And I knew. And I tried to encourage him, tried to tell him to hang in there. And at some point, you just kind of have to step back and hope that things turn out better. But with him, they didn't. And for a while, he tried to drag his wife down into it with him, down into the pit that he had dug for himself anew. And your Bible is right in what it says. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that here in a minute. But how he ended up 
after him spending some time in church was worse than it was before. Far worse. And I always had, it, it got to bad where Jody finally said, I can't, I have to separate myself from him. He lost his job because of drugs. Lost everything that he had, penniless. And the drugs and the alcohol and everything else just destroyed his body. And he's getting around on a walker. Now this guy was one of the strongest men that I knew. And it reduced him to becoming a crippled up old man before he got old enough to be a crippled up old man. And I prayed, God, bring him back around. Jody sent me a text last Saturday that said, Steve died. And I went, what? Fentanyl overdose. That's that drug that cops, it's the reason why they put gloves on now, Cubby. When they go to search somebody or their car, because just touching it can put a cop in a hospital in a coma. It's deadly. This is, this is after. I was with him when he called me and he said, Mike, we need to go see my brother. He said, my brother got out of jail, went to my sister's house. She was snorting Oxycontin. He'd never done that before, so he went over there snorting Oxys, and he's in a coma. So I went up to St. Anthony's while they've got him in a coma, not sure, breathing for him, not sure if he's going to come out of it, and he didn't, he died. The drugs took his life, and he watched that. And you know, sometimes we think, boy, when people see how you know, the wicked turned out, that'll straighten them up. He watched his brother die of a stupid drug overdose, and then went and did it. That's that threefold cord I was telling you about. Ecclesiastes 4.9 Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. That Bible's right. So, you want to get out of church. You want to get out of church. You want to get away from your Bible. You want to quit praying, talking to God. It won't work. It won't work. That's the wrong move. There's been too many people that's tried that, and it doesn't work. It turns out worse for you than you ever were before. Verse 11, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? Verse 12, now remember this, this threefold cord. Look up here on the screen, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So... If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And in this aspect, God, God left this open for us so you can understand there's multiple applications to this. And when I get done preaching this part of it, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to give you another threefold cord that'll hold on to you when you can't hold on to yourself. You'll need it. You'll need it. And there's a story in the Bible, I can't wait to preach it, but not, it's not time yet. Threefold cord is not quickly broken. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, 
but is of the world. And I'm looking, listen, everybody sitting here. I've been doing this a long time. I've been in church most of my life. In fact, the largest majority of my life, I've been in church. I've seen people come in and stay. And I've seen people come in and leave. And what you're not, I'm going to give you all the promises of God that God will love you, God will hold on to you, God will keep you, God will bind you to Him. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and I love being yoked to the Lord Jesus Christ. I love it because where I want to go, I don't get to go because I'm yoked to Christ. He won't let me. But I know what sin is capable of doing in somebody. We all know it. Because you know a Steve, don't you? You know somebody that used to be in church. You know somebody that used to have a Bible. You used to know somebody you sit in a Sunday school class. You grew up with people that you went to church with, and they're not in church now. And more than likely, they're about as far away from God as you can get. In fact, farther than they were before they started coming. Lamentations 1.14, the yoke of my transgression is bound by his hand. They are wreathed. That means it's that threefold cord, wreathed together, braided together, and come up upon my neck. He hath made my strength to fall. The Lord hath delivered me into their hands, for I am not able to rise up. I know some of your story. I know some of you. Some of you used to drink, and you could outdrink anybody. Some of you used to cheat around, whore around. Some of you used to do drugs. And, you know, you do that stuff for a while, and to just walk away from it, that don't happen. You don't just live that kind of lifestyle one day and wake up and say, you know what, I'm done with drugs. I'm not going to take any drugs anymore. Devils will climb all over you. They want to keep you in bondage. They want to hold on to you. And they're not going to make it easy on you for you to leave. Father, help me to preach this message. The one Steve that I cared about, I loved him and you saved him and he's in heaven now. The other Steve... I don't know. And God, I do not, God, please, don't let me give anybody a false hope. Because, Father, I know what that'll do. They'll think they can go out and just do anything. And that ain't right. You gave us enough warnings in this Bible, God, so that we ought to know what happens to the wicked. And we ought to know what happens to the righteous. And we ought to know the difference, who is who. So God, I'm going to preach this message. And Lord, you touch whoever you want to touch, speak to who you want to speak. But God, I just got a feeling that there's somebody out there that is seriously thinking about start playing games with their soul. And God, I beg you, God, talk them out of it before it's too late. Because it is worse with them than it was before they ever started going to church, reading the Bible, praying. It's worse. God, warn the sinner today and uplift the saint, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, very quickly, that's what I preached a couple Sundays ago, lust of the flesh, fornication, adultery, lasciviousness, wine, strong drink, drugs, both illegal and prescribed. I don't care if they, I, I don't care if they make marijuana legal. Legal is not right. It's legal to drink. Ain't right to drink. 
laziness, idleness, gluttony, filthy communications, cursing, taking the Lord's name in vain, lust of the eyes, pornography, covetousness, materialism, too much television, YouTube, Netflix, video games, pride of life, ownership, trophies, awards, love of money, boasting, racism, lying about others, gambling, political aspirations, climbing the company ladder, fraternal organization membership, and on and on and on. See, the devil would love to plant you in a Bible-believing church and have his three hooks in you so he can use you to destroy that church. You think it hasn't been tried? And the devil will put just enough false... See, the Bible calls them false brethren. They pretend to be brethren. They pretend or, or under a pretense of salvation. But it's not there. It's temporary. And they're still bound by the threefold cord of their old sins. And so the setup was to destroy Jody. That was the setup. To destroy you. And use your husband to do it. So, let me read to you some things about that. I'm going to give you this part first, and I want you to understand what I believe. Psalm 16, 1. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Do you want God to keep you to the end of your life right with Him? Raise your hand. That's, you ask God that. God, do what, do what David did. God, preserve me. God, I know what I've got in me. I know what I'm capable of. I know what sins I can run out and do that I want to do. And I don't want to do them. Get honest. This is why I've been telling you. Get honest, get honest, get honest. Because churches now are so, they are so full of hypocrites. They're full of people whose lives are still so full of sin and the preacher won't say anything about it so they think it must be okay. And it's not okay. It never was okay. Never will be okay. So while you're strong, you ask God, 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 keep me. God, you hold on to me. God, yoke me. So that I don't get to do what I want to do. God, let me get caught so I get in trouble. Let mama find out. Let daddy find out. Let the preacher find out. Let the preacher preach on my sin like he knew what I was doing. Like he's following me around all week. And some of you are going, how does brother Mike know? I don't. Well, maybe I do. But while you're strong, you say, God, preserve me. God, hang on to me. Because I don't want to end up like Steve. I mean, don't you, don't you sit there and tell me, well, I know where he is. I know he's in heaven right now. Don't you, don't you give me that stuff. I'm not the man's judge. But when they preach my funeral, I want everybody, I don't want anybody questioning where I am. What, what do you want? You want to just live like you want to live and keep all your sins and keep doing all your sins because somebody told you, oh, you can do whatever you want. You're still going to go to heaven. Is that really what you want? If you want, this is not the church for you because you're not going to find it here. I am not going to ever let you build a sinful life on a false hope that God says it's okay. Look at Psalm 37. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. I believe that. But the seed of the who? Wicked. You know who the wicked are? It's the people who do wicked. Now, look at you say, okay, there it is right there. See, they're preserved forever. Now, look at Psalm 31, 23. 
See, the Bible doctrine is here a little and there a little. You want to you wanna unhook one piece of a verse from the whole Bible and say, see, that's it right there. That's what that preacher told me one time. My daddy, my daddy refused to give up his beer drinking and everything else because a preacher told him when he was eight years old that he was going to heaven. And I grew up with a daddy that refused to come to church with his son and daughter. Because he was told he was going to heaven. So he did whatever he wanted. Ver Psalm 31, 23, O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. Now, I want to, listen, the saints are identified in this verse as those who love God. You know what sin is? Sin is a refusal to love God. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And how did, how did Jesus then lay out the law, the Ten Commandments? He boiled them down to two. The first one is what? Love the Lord your God. And then love your neighbor. And see, if Steve loved God and loved his wife, he would have never drug her out of this church. I wish that he could stand here and preach that message. Because he'd do it a lot better than me. Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth who? Who does he preserve? Say it out loud. That's who he preserves. So you know what I believe? I believe a man or a woman that God sows the seed on good ground. Listen, you don't have to worry about whether you're saved or not if you're not doing anything wrong. But let's be honest. Who in here has ever kind of slipped up a little bit, got off in a little bit of sin, and then you wondered whether or not you were still saved? Raise your hand. Be honest. You know what that's called? The fear of the Lord. It's one of the seven spirits. Now, I believe in a no-so salvation. I absolutely believe it. I believe you can know it. But God keeps His saints. He keeps them. So, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. So you know what the proud doer is? He's the guy that thinks, oh, the preacher said I'm saved, so I'm going to go out and keep drinking and keep slutting around on my wife. And I'm going to keep doing drugs. And I'm going to keep my stash of pornography away from everybody's. Nobody knows I'm doing it, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep stealing stuff at work. I'm going to keep cheating on my taxes, cheating on my wife, cheating on everybody. You're a proud doer. Because you're doing it thinking that you can continue this way and God still has to save you. You're an idiot. You're a fool. You're playing you know what you're doing? You're tempting God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Because that's what the devil said. Jesus, jump! Because God said his angels had to come down and pick you up. Jesus said, uh, excuse me, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. If I fall, they'll pick me up. But I ain't about to be stupid enough to jump. That's some snake handlers. Oh, God said we can handle these snakes and they won't bite us. How many of them have been bitten and, got, and died and got killed by that? Arrogance. Pride. God, God plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Psalm 
Psalm 141.10, Let the wicked fall into their own nets, whilst that I withal escape. Who made the net of your own fall? Who did that? You did. You made your own net. You dug your own pit. Job 18, verse 5, Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candle shall be put out with him. The steps of his strength shall be straightened, and his own counsel shall cast him down. That is you telling you that you can go and sin all you want to, and God has to save you. See, that was the... The, what was it? His, your own counsel casting you down. You said that you could go out and do whatever you wanted. God did not say that to you. God does not say that to you. The gin, you know, that I, I had looked at it. For he cast into a net by his own feet, and he walketh upon a snare. The gin, Brother George, what is that? A snare. A gin is an engine or a mechanism. Because you was telling me about snares the other day. Am I right? Was that you? You with your mustache and haircut and all that stuff? What, what was it you told me? You, you put a snare, you, see, you know what he does? He goes out and he looks for a path that these animals walk in. He puts the snare in their pathway because he knows that they're going to go back by there again. Did I get it right? That's what a snare is. And you listen to me. You keep going back to sin, don't you? You've got a well-worn path back to your own sins. And the devil knows that you're going to walk right back by there again because your footprints are there. And the reason why there's a path is that you've walked there numerous times. This Bible's right, people, and you're not. The gin shall take him by the heel. And the robber shall prevail against him. The snare is laid for him in the ground and a trap for him in the way. There it is, Brother George, right there. It's exactly what you said. It's laid for him in the way. I told you about that guy I used to work with. We called him Cowboy. He always wore cowboy boots, cowboy hat, and he had a horse, and he liked, he liked doing cowboy stuff. So I come out one afternoon after work, out of the shop there on Z Highway, put in my time card, and he was standing out there with a rope. And I said, Brian, I'll see you later. He said, see you, Michael. And I knew what he was going to try to do. So I kept very arrogantly just kept on walking. I'm going, I ain't some cow. He took that lariat and he flipped that out there in front of me. And I thought that I had to step in it. And so I was ready to step over it. Chris is laughing. He had me right where, because that rope is stiff. And he can make that thing dance if he wants to. And as soon as I raised my foot up, he gave that lariat a flip, and he pulled on that thing. He raised it up, that circle laying on the ground. He raised that up and pulled it and put it right over. I'm going like this. <laughs> and he t I turn around, look at him, and he's laughing. He said, leave it lay and watch it pay, Michael. That was me not knowing how it worked. Now that I know how it works, if I caught him doing that again, I'm not moving. I'm not, 
I'm not giving him that foot ever again. You see what I'm saying? The devil has a trap laid for you guys. And it's a trap and a snare set in the path where he knows you're going to go. Because you've been there before. Uh, turn to 2 Peter. Yeah, 2 Peter chapter 2. I want to give you this. Now, I, listen, I understand that maybe my, my view of salvation may not jive with something you've always believed, something you've always taught. I, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to be contrary to you. I don't want to say anything that's wrong. I've, I've searched this Bible just like everybody else does. I'm looking for answers. And there was a time when, I mean, the devil, he had me in the snare. And it was by the grace of God. Because you know what I did? I cried out to God and said, God, I don't want to be this way. I don't want, I don't want it. I don't want to lose my family. I don't want to lose my, my friends. I don't want to lose my church. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't, God, I don't want to lose you. God wrote Israel a bill of divorce. He said, I'm, done, I'm sick of you. I'm done with you. Out. I don't want that. You see, that's the difference. That's the difference. To those that really want help, and you call out to God, God will help you. Let me tell you what he'll do. I had an uncle that was a truck driver. Truck drivers do two things really well. They drive trucks really well, and they smoke a lot of cigarettes very fast and very well. And he was a truck driver, three packs a day. And he got to where he's, I don't want to suck them things no more. So this back, this back years ago, he went to his clinic, see? And they had a little method, you know, they was going to talk to him a little bit, and, and, and this back before they gave you a patch, you know. And what they did was, they had a bowl, one of those big silver bowls, you know what I'm talking about, you mix up stuff in, big silver bowl full of cigarette butts and ashes. Full of it. Now ain't nothing stinks worse than wetted down cigarette butts and ashes. Nothing. So they had... Ten lucky strikes sitting there, unfiltered, and they said, you're going to chain smoke these down as fast as you can go. Suck them in, suck them all the way down to the very bottom of your lungs. We want smoke to come out of your toenails. Suck them down deep, suck them down fast, and hold your head over this bowl of wet ashes and cigarette butts. What, he, what they had, knew they had to do is they had to train his mind into associating his vomit because he said, my shoes came up out of my throat. I puked so hard that night. What happened was, they knew that they had to train his mind differently. To get his mind that when he smokes, those things taste like puke. He remembers that event, and it changed his mind. In the next time he lit up a cigarette, they, they, it wasn't, he wasn't getting the joy out of it that apparently you get out of going... See, I've never done that, so I don't know that, but apparently you go. Right? (laughs) 
Well, he said the next time he lit one up, it, didn't, it tasted terrible to him. He remembered that smell and that puke. Made him sick. That was the start. So here's what God's got to do to you. God has to make the distastefulness of your sin so intense to you and His pending wrath about ready to be poured out on you, God literally has to scare hell right out of you. If He loves you, He will. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. I believe my Bible. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. Entangled. Threefold cord. Entangled. And overcome. See, that's the key right there. All of us get entangled. But thank God, not overcome. And I'm afraid that my friend Steve got overcome. I mean, he didn't, he was in bad shape, but he didn't die because he was in bad shape. He died because he kept doing drugs until they killed him. That's overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Jody, is that right? You saw him. See, can I tell what I know? After, after me warning him to stay away from a certain young lady, he knocked her up. After him looking me in the eye saying, Mike, I don't want that. See, I've been lied to by a lot of people. I'm the preacher. If they lie to anybody, for some reason, John, they lie to the preacher. And that bugs me because I don't want to hurt anybody. I want to help. But you get honest. And he wouldn't get honest, Steve. I keep, I keep running into these Steves. I love my Steves because one of my Steves is in heaven. And I know it because he came to me a week and he said, Mike, I want to know for sure that I'm going to heaven. And I said, Steve, I can see the difference in you. You don't want that sin no more. He didn't want it no more. And he died and he went to heaven that week. And the other Steve would stand here and tell you, it's not worth it. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. When you say a dog lap up its own vomit. That's you, where you're headed, if you don't ask God to stop you. The latter end is worse than the beginning. Now you try to wrap your theology donut around that, however you want to. But every now and then, the preacher's got to warn the saints about the consequences of sin. And I'm warning you. You got it in you. I know you do. Because I got it in me. And I fight my battles. 
And I'm always, I'm always going to be for you and with you while you fight yours. But if you roll over and quit, I got to stand back. I have to stand back and watch you turn your life into far worse than it ever would have been. And I don't want to do that. God loves you enough that He's willing to forgive you yet again. And He would have forgiven Steve again. But He didn't want it. He didn't want it. You got to want it. You gotta want it more than you want anything else in this world. Because there is nothing, there is nothing in this world worth dying and going to hell over. Nothing. So you got your threefold cord, don't you? It's gonna pull you down. It's gonna pull you down. And it's not getting better. We're, we're headed, folks. We're headed toward Armageddon. We're headed toward the fulfillment of everything God said in this book. And it could very well be that somebody sitting, listening to me right now, goes and gets a mark in their right hand or forehead. I don't want that. I don't want it for you. I don't want it for anybody in my family. You think I ain't preaching to my own family? I am. Because I love them. And Daddy knows what's out there. So, who will be with me this morning that will come and meet at the cross and will be like David who said, God, preserve me. God, keep me. Because I don't want to fall away.